Chapter 42 The front gates of the Assassin's Keep were open, the gravel drive and manicured lawn lit with shimmering glass lamps. The pale stone estate itself was bright, beautiful, and inviting. Aelin had told them what to expect on the carriage ride over, but even as they came to a stop at the foot of the gates, she looked at the two males crammed in with her and said, Be on your guard and keep your fat mouths shut, especially with the Valg commander. No matter what you hear or see, just keep your fat mouths shut. No psychotic territorial bullshit. Adian chuckled. Remind me to tell you tomorrow how charming you are. But she wasn't in the mood to laugh. Nezrin jumped down from the driver's seat and opened the carriage door. Aelin stepped out, leaving her cloak behind, and didn't dare look to the house across the street, to the roof where Kale and a few rebels were providing backup in case things went very, very wrong. She was halfway up the marble steps when the carved oak doors swung open, flooding the threshold with golden light. It wasn't the butler standing there smiling at her with two white teeth. Welcome home, Arabin purred. He beckoned them into the carnivorous entry hall, and welcome to your friends. Adian and Nezrin moved around the carriage to the trunk in the back. Her cousin's nondescript sword was drawn as they opened the compartment and yanked out the chained, hooded figure. Your favor, Aelin said as they hauled him to his feet. The Valg commander thrashed and stumbled in their grip as they led him toward the house, the hood over his head swaying this way and that. A low, vicious hissing noise crept out from under the coarse-knit fibers. I would have preferred the servant's door for our guest, Arabin said tightly. He was in green, green for Terrasin, though most would assume it was to offset his auburn hair, a way to confuse their assumptions about his intentions, his allegiance. He wore no weapons she could see, and there was nothing but warmth in those silver eyes as he held out his hands to her, as if Adian wasn't now tugging a demon up the front steps. Behind them, Nezrin steered the carriage away. She could feel Rowan bristling, sense Adian's disgust, but she blocked them out. She took Arabin's hands, dry, warm, calloused. He squeezed her fingers gently, peering into her face. You look ravishing, but I'd expect nothing less. Not even a bruise after trapping our guests. Impressive. He leaned closer, sniffing. And you smell divine, too. I'm glad my gift was put to good use. From the corner of her eye, she saw Rowan straighten, and she knew he slid into the killing calm. Neither Rowan nor Adian wore visible weapons save for the single blade her cousin now had out, but she knew they were both armed beneath their clothes, and knew Rowan would snap Arabin's neck if he so much as blinked wrong at her. It was that thought alone that made her smile at Arabin. You look well, she said. I suppose you already know my companions. He faced Adian, who was busy digging his sword into the commander's side as a gentle reminder to keep moving. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting your cousin. She knew Arabin took in every detail as Adian came closer, pushing his charge before him, trying to find any weaknesses, anything to use to his advantage. Adian just continued into the house, the Val commander stumbling across the threshold. You've recovered well, General, Arabin said. Or should I call you your highness, in honor of your Ashriver lineage? Whichever you prefer, of course. She knew that Arabin had no plans to let that demon, and Stevan, leave this house alive. Adian gave Arabin a lazy grin over his shoulder. I don't give a shit what you call me. He shoved the Valg commander farther inside. Just take this running thing off my hands. Arabin smiled blandly, unfazed. He'd calculated Adian's hatred. With deliberate slowness, he turned to Rowan. You? I don't know, Arabin mused, having to lift his head to see Rowan's face. He made a show of looking Rowan over. It's been an age since I saw one of the Fae. I don't remember them being quite so large. Rowan moved deeper into the entry hall, every step laced with power and death, coming to a stop at her side. You can call me Rowan. That's all you need to know. He cocked his head to the side, a predator assessing prey. Thank you for the oil, he added. My skin was a little dry. Arabin blinked, as much surprise as he'd show. It took her a moment to process what Rowan had said, and to realize that the almond smell hadn't just been coming from her. He'd worn it too. Arabin flicked his attention to Adian and the Valg commander. Third door on the left, take him downstairs. Use the fourth cell. Aelin didn't dare look at her cousin as he dragged Stevan along. There was no sign of the other assassins, not even a servant. Whatever Arabin had planned, he didn't want any witnesses. Arabin trailed after Adian, his hands in his pockets. But Aelin remained in the hall for a moment, looking at Rowan. His brows were high as she read the words in his eyes, his posture. He never specified that only you had to wear it. Her throat tightened, and she shook her head. What? he seemed to ask. You just... 
She shook her head again. Surprise me sometimes. Good. I'd hate for you to get bored. Despite herself, despite what was to come, a smile tugged on her lips as Rowan took her hand and gripped it tightly. When she turned to head into the dungeons, her smile faded as she found Arabin watching. Rowan was about a hair's breadth from ripping out the King of the Assassins' throat as he led them down, down, down into the dungeons. Rowan kept a step behind Aelin while they descended the long curving stone staircase, the reek of mildew and blood and rust growing stronger with each step. He'd been tortured enough, and done enough torturing himself, to know what this place was. To know what sort of training Aelin had received down here. A girl. She'd been a girl when the red-haired bastard a few steps ahead had brought her here and taught her how to cut up men, how to keep them alive while she did it, how to make them scream and plead, how to end them. There was no part of her that disgusted him, no part of her that scared him, but the thought of her in this place, with these smells, in this darkness? With every step down the stairs, Aelin's shoulders seemed to droop, her hair seeming to grow duller, her skin paler. This is where she'd last seen Sam, he realized, and her master knew it. We use this for most of our meetings, harder to eavesdrop or be caught unawares, Arabin said to no one in particular, though it also has other uses, as you'll soon see. He opened door after door, and it seemed to Rowan that Aelin was counting them, waiting, until, shall we? Arabin said, gesturing toward the cell door. Rowan touched her elbow. Gods, his self-control had to be in shreds tonight. He couldn't stop making excuses to touch her. But his touch was essential. Her eyes met his, dim and cold. You give the word, just one damn word, and he's dead, and then we can search this house from top to bottom for that amulet. She shook her head as she entered the cell, and he understood it well enough. Not yet. Not yet. She'd almost balked on the stairs to the dungeon, and it was only the thought of the amulet, only the warmth of the fey warrior at her back that made her put one foot in front of the other and descend into the dark stone interior. She would never forget this room. It still haunted her dreams. The table was empty, but she could still see him there, broken, almost unrecognizable, the scent of Gloriella clinging to his body. Sam had been tortured in ways she hadn't even known until she read Wesley's letter. The worst of it had been requested by Arabin. Requested, as punishment for Sam's loving her. Punishment for tampering with Arabin's belongings. Arabin sauntered into the room, hands in his pockets. Rowan's sharp sniff told her enough about what this place smelled like. Such a dark, cold room where they'd put Sam's body. Such a dark, cold room where she'd vomited and then laid beside him on that table for hours and hours, unwilling to leave him where Adian now chained Stevan to the wall. Get out, Arabin said simply to Rowan and Adian, who stiffened. The two of you can wait upstairs. We don't need unnecessary distractions, and neither does our guest. Over my rotting corpse, Adian snapped. Aelin shot him a sharp look. Lysandra is waiting for you in the drawing room, Arabin said with expert politeness, his eyes now fixed on the hooded Valg chained to the wall. Stevens' gloved hands tugged at the chains, his incessant hissing rising above with impressive violence. She'll entertain you. We'll be up for dinner shortly. Rowan was watching Aelin very, very carefully. She gave him a slight nod. Rowan met Adian's gaze. The general stared right back. Honestly, had she been anywhere else, she might have pulled up a chair to watch this latest little dominance battle. Thankfully, Adian just turned toward the stairs. A moment later, they were gone. Arabin stalked to the demon and snatched the hood from his head. Black, rage-filled eyes glared at them and blinked, scanning the room. We can do this the easy way or the hard way, Arabin drawled. Stevan just smiled. Aelin listened to Arabin interrogate the demon, demanding to know what it was, where it had come from, what the king wanted. After 30 minutes and minimal slicing, the demon was talking about anything and everything. How does the king control you? Arabin pushed. The demon laughed. Wouldn't you like to know? Arabin half turned to her, holding up his dagger, a trickle of dark blood sliding down the blade. Would you like to do the honors? This is for your benefit, after all. She frowned at her dress. I don't want to get blood on it. Arabin smirked and slashed his dagger down the man's pectoral. The demon screeched, drowning out the pitter platter of blood on the stones. The ring! It panted after a moment. We've all got them. Arabin paused, and Aelin cocked her head. Left, left hand, it said. Arabin yanked off the man's glove, revealing a black ring. How? He has a ring, too. Uses it to control us all. Ring goes on, and it doesn't come off. We do what he says, whatever he says. 
Where did you get the rings from? Made them. I don't know. The dagger came closer. I swear. We wear the rings and he makes a cut on our arms, licks our blood so it's in him, and then he controls us however he wants. It's the blood that links us. And what does he plan to do with you all now that you're invading my city? We're searching for the general. I won't... I won't tell anyone he's here or that she's here, I swear. The rest, the rest, I don't know. His eyes met hers, dark, pleading. Kill him, she said to Arabin. He's a liability. Please, Stevan said, his eyes still holding hers. She looked away. He does seem to have run out of things to tell me, Arabin mused. Swift as an adder, Arabin lunged for him, and Stevan screamed so loudly it hurt her ears as Arabin sliced off his finger and the ring that held it in one brutal movement. Thank you, Arabin said above Stevan's screaming, and then slashed his knife across the man's throat. Aelin stepped clear of the spray of blood, holding Stevan's stare as the light faded from his gaze. When the spray had slowed, she frowned at Arabin. You could have killed him and then cut off the ring. Where would the fun be in that? Arabin held up the bloody finger and pried off the ring. Lost your bloodlust? I'd dump that ring in the Avery if I were you. The king is enslaving people to his will with these things. I plan to study this one as best I can. Of course he did. He pocketed the ring and inclined his head toward the door. Now that we're even, darling, shall we eat? It was an effort to nod with Stevan's still bleeding body sagging from the wall. Aelin was seated to Arabin's right, as she'd always been. She'd expected Lysander to be across from her, but instead the courtesan was beside her, no doubt meant to reduce her options to two, deal with her longtime rival or talk to Arabin, or something like that. She had bid hello to Lysandra, who had been keeping Adian and Rowan company in the drawing room, keenly aware of Arabin on her heels as she shook Lysandra's hand, subtly passing over the note she'd kept hidden in her dress all night. The note was gone by the time Aelin leaned in to kiss the courtesan's cheek, the peck of someone not entirely thrilled to be doing so. Arabin had seated Rowan to his left, with Adian beside the warrior. The two members of her court were separated by the table, to keep them from reaching her, and to leave her unprotected from Arabin. Neither had asked what happened in the dungeon. I have to say, Arabin mused as their first course, tomato and basil soup, courtesy of the vegetables grown in the hothouse in the back, was cleared away by silent servants who had been summoned now that Stevan had been dealt with. Aelin recognized some, though they didn't look at her. They had never looked at her, even when she was living here. She knew they wouldn't dare whisper a word about who dined at this table tonight, not with Arabin as their master. You are a rather quiet group, or has my protege scared you into silence? Adian, who had watched every bite she took of that soup, lifted an eyebrow. You want us to make small talk after you just interrogated and butchered a demon? Arabin waved a hand. I'd like to hear more about you all. Careful, she said too quietly to Arabin. The king of the assassins straightened the silverware, flanking his plate. Shouldn't I be concerned about who my protege is living with? You weren't concerned about who I was living with when you had me shipped off to Endovier. A slow blink. Is that what you think I did? Lysander stiffened beside her. Arabin noted the movement, as he noted every movement, and said, Lysander can tell you the truth. I fought tooth and nail to free you from that prison. I lost half my men to the effort, all of them tortured and killed by the king. I'm surprised your friend the captain didn't tell you. Such a pity he's on rooftop watch tonight. He missed nothing, it seemed. Arabin looked to Lysandra, waiting. She swallowed and murmured, He did try, you know, for months and months. It was so convincing that Aelin might have believed it. Through some miracle, Arabin had no idea that the woman had been meeting with them in secret. Some miracle, or Lysandra's own wits. Aelin drawled to Arabin. Do you plan on telling me why you insisted we stay for dinner? How else would I get to see you? You would have just dumped that thing on my doorstep and left. And we learned so much, so much that we could use, together. The chill down her spine wasn't fate. Though I have to say, this new you is more... subdued. I suppose for Lysander that's a good thing. She always looks at that hole you left in the entry wall when you threw that dagger at her head. I kept it there as a little reminder of how much we all missed you. Rowan was watching her, an asp ready to strike, but his brows bunched slightly, as if to say, you really threw a dagger at her head? Arabin began talking about a time Aelin had brawled with Lysandra, and they'd rolled down the stairs, scratching and yowling like cats. So Aelin looked at Rowan a moment longer. I was a tad hot-headed. I'm beginning to admire Lysandra more and more. Seventeen-year-old Aelin must have been a delight to deal with. She fought the twitching in her lips. 
I would pay good money to see 17-year-old Aelin meet 17-year-old Rowan. His green eyes glittered. Arabin was still talking. 17-year-old Rowan wouldn't have known what to do with you. He could barely speak to females outside of his family. Liar. I don't believe that for a second. It's true. You would have scandalized him with your night clothes, even with that dress you have on. She sucked on her teeth. He would probably have been more scandalized to learn that I'm not wearing any undergarments beneath this dress. The table rattled as Rowan's knee banged into it. Arobin paused, but continued when Adian asked about what the demon had told him. You can't be serious, Rowan seemed to say. Did you see any place where this dress might hide them? Every line and wrinkle would show. Rowan shook his head subtly, his eyes dancing with the light that she'd only recently come to glimpse and cherish. Do you delight in shocking me? She couldn't stop her smile. How else am I supposed to keep a cranky immortal entertained? His grin was distracting enough that it took her a moment to notice the silence and that everyone was staring at them, waiting. She glanced at Arabin, whose face was a mask of stone. Did you ask me something? There was only calculating ire in his silver eyes, which might have once made her start begging for mercy. I asked, Arabin said, if you've had fun these past few weeks, wrecking my investment properties and ensuring that all my clients won't touch me. 